Hi, my name is Scott Roberts. I'm with the Freedom Foundation. And coming up here on November 6th is the general election. And I'm sure many of you uh, have thought a lot about the candidates that you're going to be voting for, but haven't, but may not even know about the ballot measures. And ballot measures come in a number of different forms. We're here today with Steve Buckstein from the Cascade Policy Institute and Glenn Morgan, also from the Freedom Foundation, to talk about Oregon and Washington ballot initiatives. In Washington, there are let me see, four, five, six, seven, eight <laughs> ballot initiatives total. There's three initiatives, a referendum, two resolutions, and two advisory votes. In Oregon, there's a combination of uh, initiatives by the people and referred initiatives uh, from the legislature. And there's a total of nine ballot measures in Oregon. So we've got a whole plate full of things to talk about in a short period of time today. If you'd like to know more about the Washington uh, ballot measures, you can go to the We the People Forum on October 25th at 7 p.m. at the library here in Vancouver, and they're gonna have an hour discussion about ballot measures. You can get more information there, or you can go to the Freedom Foundation's website, myfreedomfoundation.com, or the informedvoterguide.com, and you can get a copy of our, uh, our voter's guide, our informed voter's guide, and what that has, a, a breakdown of all the uh, ballot measures in it as well. So Glenn, would you like to start off and talk a little bit about what's going on in Washington and what, what people should be looking out for as a, as a high point on, on the ballots? Sure, Scott. And, you know, it's pretty interesting how the several of these different initiatives uh, are working. I think that uh, a couple of them that we'll want to talk about is, and I think, uh, Steve, feel free to chime in because I know there's some similar things going on down in Oregon as well, but we have uh, one of them is the Tim Imons Initiative 1185 which is the uh, initiative that's going to re still maintain this two-thirds requirement before the legislature can pass taxes. And this hasn't been super popular among people up at the uh, legislature who like to increase taxes. And uh, that ballot is on the on, that is, that initiative is on the ballot again because uh, every after two years, the legislature can overrule a ballot initiative if they choose to do so. And since they've historically done that in the past, Tim Myman got this initiative again on the ballot so that uh, they can't overrule it again this time. Okay, so let's talk about this, about this initiative. So this, this is a big deal. This is mm -hmm. what the third time it's, coming up, it's come up. Correct. The legislature has made it, basically Tim Myman re-up this initiative now twice, and mm -hmm. he's preempting it on the third time. Right. He's up the game every time he's, he's passed this initiative. So right. the first time it was just a simple two-thirds majority vote to raise taxes and fees. Mm -hmm. The second time he upped the game, and what did he do the second time? Well, part of it's also requiring that every time that the legislature does pass a vote, or, or does pass a tax, I should say, that, uh, that the people get a chance to have an advisory vote on whether they approve the tax increase by the legislature. Okay, so that's in this particular initiative. Is it, this a it is again, and you know what's interesting, that's why we have two of these advisory votes on the ballot as well, which we can talk about later, but basically there were two tax increases that the legislature had has passed this last year, and they waited until the last minute and they just put it on uh, the ballot for the first time ever in Washington State. We get to, as, as voters, get to go back and say, uh, do we approve of these tax increases or not? So an advisory vote hmm. is kind of like the, the, the people's last say. It's non-binding. The legislature has right. already acted. That's right. The people get to vote and basically tell the legislature whether they like their vote or not. It's, kind that's of, it's, correct. A, it's an after-the-fact kind of, kind of deal, right? Non-binding. That, that's correct. I mean, for the most part, it probably just becomes a political uh, fodder for the next election cycle as to whether those uh, politicians took the correct vote or not. Based right, on what the and so it's said. my understanding this is the first time ever we have advisory votes yep. on the ballot. Uh, we have two of them. So Th that's we'll, correct. We'll and get into those. And that right. is directly as a result of an initiative uh, from a number of years ago, Initiative 960, that Tim Iman put on the ballot then. Okay, now what's so important about the two-thirds uh, initiative that Tim Iman has put, put forth to me is that it's completely changed the discussion in Olympia. Mm -hmm. No longer, I mean, there's a lot of legislators that go up there and think their job is just simply to raise taxes, right? right. It's, it's my job, I've been elected, it's my job to go raise taxes. But this uh, limits their ability to raise taxes. They have to get a, a supermajority consensus of the legislature yeah. in order to do so. That's correct. Right, and that, and, and now it's, it's, it's even being increased this year with this advisory vote piece. So is there anything else that you want to talk about uh, with that, with Tim Iman's initiative? I, no, that about covers it. I think that the uh, voters in Washington State are very familiar with this initiative. They voted for it twice. So this is the third time around. <laughs> and I think at this point in time, it's becoming old hat for the voters. And uh, they've become pretty familiar now with... Um, uh, you know, with what the, the terms of this initiative are. Okay, and one more time, the, the initiative number... Is 1185. 1185. And it's okay. going to be on the ballot. And it's one of three um, 
So yeah, that's a that's a big deal. Okay, let's kick it back over to Oregon, Steve. What's what's the top ballot measure in your mind that's going on in Oregon? People should be aware of. What's, well, what's first happening? of all, let me just mention uh, in Oregon, legislators can raise taxes with a three fifths vote, not two thirds. I like the two thirds idea. Yeah. Um, the last time that happened was in two thousand nine when we got uh, quote unquote taxes on the rich. And there was no advisory process. Uh, I like that also. Mm -hmm. We had to raise signatures, the citizens did, to put those to a vote of the people. And unfortunately, the people approved them barely, which was a hurt Oregon's economy, but that's another story. Um, I think the, the, there are a couple measures on the Oregon ballot that are involving taxes. The one that I think has the, in my mind, um, the biggest potential impact uh, which doesn't relate to Washington very well because Oregon has an income tax. We have a personal income tax and a corporate income tax, which you don't. You have different forms of taxation. But we also have what's called the kicker system. So when the state economist estimates what revenue is coming in from income taxes over the next two-year period, if he's wrong by 2%, in other words, if revenue exceeds the estimate by 2% or more, the whole excess goes back to the people who paid the taxes, corporations and the and the people in personal income taxes. The public employee unions have put on the ballot this time a measure that, uh, as I define it, they wouldn't define it this way, um, is stealing the corporate kicker for the children. For the children always resonates. So <laughs> what they're saying is we need more money for our public schools. So if- Does for the children mean the operations fund of the union? Is that right, exactly. a translation here? Okay. <laughs> but this will take the money from the corporate kicker, not the personal, because all voters virtually pay personal income taxes, that would be harder to pass. But those evil out-of-state corporations, as the unions in effect define them, nobody loves them. So mm -hmm. you know, take their money, put it in the general fund. Supposedly, the language is for the public school system. But the, when you look at it legally, there's nothing that says the legislature can't write that check to the schools and then take away the same amount of money out of what they would have given the schools in the general fund. So it'll basically be a feeding frenzy by all the public employee unions, mm -hmm. most of whom are not in the public school system. Some are teachers, many are not. So it just grows government. It takes money from the private sector. It's measure 85, mm -hmm. which was put on, again, put on the ballot by the public employee unions. I think it'll set a terrible precedent if it, if it passes. So measure 85 is taking corporate, the corporate kicker Right. Uh, and making it uh, union kickbacks, is that? Exactly. Uh, okay. Exactly. Okay, th so that's, uh, and that's ballot measure 85. 85. That's the okay. last one on our ballot. Okay. So if people get all the way through, <laughs> sometimes they don't. Uh, that's one to really look at. Okay, well on, on the theme of education and for the children, we uh, in, in, in Washington happen to have a ballot measure uh, in Initiative 1240, it's about charter schools. So. That's right. Yeah. Initiative 1240 is basically, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a public charter school initiative. And uh, that'll be on the ballot this year. And what's interesting about this is that uh, there's quite a bit of controversy around this particular uh, ballot initiative. I happen to be on a school board m myself, and so I've heard a lot of the debate that's, that's gone on in the education community. And, the, and uh, what's interesting is that it basically the, the supporters of this initiative are saying that there's 41 states that already have charter schools. Washington State's one of the very few states that doesn't have charter schools or doesn't allow them. And so th what they want is the supporters of the initiative are saying, listen, we're the only, one of the few states left that don't allow charter schools. Let's try charter schools here. They've been tried elsewhere and uh, with, with some success and failure, depending on what, what, you, what you look at. What's interesting is the opposition to this has been it has been kind of from a lot of different sides. Very strong pro-choice um, education folk have opposed it because they said it doesn't go far enough. And then the public sector unions, largely a teachers union, has opposed it because under the charter schools, they, the unions would have their own contract separate from whatever contract exists there, and they don't want to lose their monopoly over the, the, the union uh, side of it. The school directors association has opposed it because, by definition, charter schools are pulled out of local control, and so therefore the local school district, uh, school board doesn't necessarily have control over what those um, charter schools can do. So uh, is an initiative or a piece of legislation that nobody can agree on, is that the, is that the best <laughs> one? Is that the one that actually works? Or? You know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things where I, I think, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really make everybody, whether you're really in favor of charter schools or whether you're really opposed, it doesn't really perfectly solve whatever those factions agree on. However, it does kind of open the door to some, and it's fairly limited, it's only 40 charter schools around the state, and uh, it, it opens the door to really more of a pilot program for charter schools than anything else. It's not really as, as uh, earth-changing as, as the opponents have sometimes said it is. And uh, some people come out very strongly in favor of it. The Gates uh, uh, Foundation, which has been involved tremendously in education in Washington State, has, has uh, largely funded uh, this initiative. And it seems to be gaining a lot of attention around the state. 
So I should t just take a break here just for one second as I, I was reminded uh, that both the Freedom Foundation and the Cascade Policy Institute are 501c3 nonprofits, which means uh, they are there for the good of the public. They don't take positions on, on either ballot measures or candidates. They don't oppose uh, or support either of those types of things. And Steve Buckstein, who's a founder of the Cascade Policy Institute, certainly knows that well, and so is Glenn Morgan with the Freedom Foundation. We're here in a roundtable discussion today, so if there's anything that they say that might be construed as uh, endorsing or opposing a ballot measure, it's, it's strictly their, their own opinions. It's not that of the foundations that they, that they represent. Uh, Steve, you, you have something to do with, uh, when we talked about education, um, we're, we're leading up to a brief discussion about the legalization of marijuana because I we, have, uh, we have a ballot measure in Washington, I believe you have a ballot yes. measure in Oregon. Is there anything that you want to mention? Well, first of all, on the charter school idea, uh, Cascade Policy Institute and others helped um, legalize charter schools in Oregon in 1999, maybe one of the few things where we're ahead of <laughs> uh, our, our uh, friends in, in Washington state. And we have over 100 of them now, and they've worked very well. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, which a lot of people get wrong, they are public schools. That's right. The funding still is public funding. Mm -hmm. um, there's no tuition. It's not a private school. And um, it's an option for a lot of parents. And we like it in Oregon. The unions have been opposed to it. Uh, some uh, school board boards have been opposed. But in Oregon, I'm not sure how it works in Washington, proposed. But in Oregon, primarily the school district where the charter school is going to be located gets to say yes or no on the, the charter. And oftentimes they say no because they don't want the competition. Right. We're opening up that to a little bit more uh, competition than, than before, but, but so far that's been the case. But again, we've had a lot of charter schools. We like them, um, including online charter schools. I don't know if that's part of what you're doing, but, but we like the idea that, that uh, for kids where brick and mortar schools don't work or haven't worked, they have an option of online charter schools now anywhere in Oregon, and uh, we think that's a, a huge step forward. Yeah, Steve, absolutely. The position, the policy position of the Freedom Foundation is that we support choice in, in school. So uh, we believe that every student doesn't learn the same way and that factories are failing our, uh, these, these school factories or brick and mortar are failing a, a large population of the students. And we uh, think our, we, we have an online learning program that we support and, and uh, charter schools and voucher programs and all those types of things. Anything that provides more choice in education is... Right. Is, uh, and, and probably uh, one of the maybe few things that uh, President Obama agrees with the Freedom Foundation is that he likes charter schools too, apparently. Right. And is uh, um, US, the U.S. Secretary of Education that he appointed likes charter schools. So we're in good company there okay. on that issue. <laughs> so let's move on from education to marijuana. So, <laughs> so Glenn, you want to kick off uh, with Initiative 502 here. Yeah, Initiative 502 is uh, largely about legalizing the recreational use of marijuana and taxing it in Washington State so that the uh, Washington State Liquor Control Board can uh, impose a 25% tax on the sale of marijuana and basically regulate it from that standpoint and tax it. And additionally, it also introduces a uh, DUI standard for marijuana, so that if you're driving under the influence of marijuana, there's a very strict standard that it's going to define um, that you can be arrested uh, and treated just like it would be if you were driving under the influence of alcohol. Okay, so in Washington right now, mm -hmm. marijuana is legal only under the uh, 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 medical marijuana. You have yeah. to have prescription. That's for, correct. And, you, and th there's dispensaries that, that, that give it out. And That's it, correct. This would actually legalize marijuana for recreational use across the board. Right. What I find interesting about this is that one of the groups that really oppose this initiative to just open it up and make it recreational use is is the dispensaries, the, pe the, <laughs> it is. the, the, the it people is. that are currently able to distribute marijuana right now. They, That's it's right. going to break up their monopoly, right? It is. It's going to break up their monopoly. They're very upset about it. Um, they're also opposed to it largely because they think that the DUI standards are too um, strict and that e their, their arguments are that if you've used marijuana within a month, you'd still be technically a D under DUI uh, requirement. I'm not sure about the, the details on that debate, but I do know they had quite a contentious uh, uh, protest this last Friday, uh, up a, a big uh, big argument and confrontations at the uh, state capitol. So, you know, there's a lot of emotions behind it. What's interesting about this particular initiative is that of all of the marijuana initiatives that are currently on the ballot across the country, this election cycle, most of the polls say that the Washington initiative is the most likely one to pass, which is why there's been a lot of out-of-state money that's come in to uh, support this initiative. Okay, Steve, um, do you, you have a marijuana initiative? We, have, we also, uh, it's Measure 80 in Oregon okay. to, in effect, legalize um, use and sale of marijuana for recreational purposes, but it comes with a lot of uh, restrictions that we're not happy with, so okay. um, we, as a, actually Measure 80 is the one measure on Oregon's ballot where our board is 
taken a position formally, okay. which is no position, which is basically <laughs> to say there's, there are a number of pluses. We like the idea of ending the war on drugs. We think it's very harmful to our society. But what ours does is partially just what Washington got rid of, the state liquor stores. Our measure would legalize, in effect, legalize marijuana, but would set up a system of state marijuana stores that it would have to be sold through. Mm -hmm. Just at the time when we're trying to copy what Washington did, which is get rid of our, of our liquor stores, uh, which are antiquated and, and uh, basically. Yeah, Washington, <laughs> Washington kicked, uh, uh, kicked the state out of the uh, retail and distribution uh, of, of uh, liquor because they weren't doing right. a good job, presumably. And uh, now Oregon wants to pick up the, uh, the sale, the retail, and distribution yeah. of marijuana. And, and so on balance, um, you know, again, there are pluses, minuses. I think, I think on balance, from personally, my standpoint, it's probably a step in the right direction that hopefully at the same time we get rid of the liquor stores, we can get rid of the mar <laughs> marijuana stores <laughs> if it passes. But the polls show that ours is not likely to pass compared to Washington, which is likely to pass. You know, and I should mention that that, that removal of the liquor stores in Washington State was a ballot initiative as well. Right. And so it's this, and the other interesting thing about the marijuana initiative is largely it, it creates a federalism conflict too if it gets passed. It's very distinctly in opposition to the federal law. And so it, it, um, it opens up an interesting uh, conflict there with Washington State and the federal government on the enforcement of this specific Oregon issue. Oregon is the same way. We would be right. in conflict with federal law if, if our measure passed. Right. Well, be careful about getting the state into the distribution system. It took us not only one ballot, uh, one, one initiative, but we had, they, they, they ran it twice. Yeah, it was one of the right. largest co costing initiatives in the state of Washington. Yeah, one of the most expensive ones. Yeah, that's to right. Get, to get uh, you have other things on the ballot. What else is going on? Well, another big one um, in Oregon, which is causing a fair amount of interest, is Measure 84, okay. which would phase out our death tax or our inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a personal income tax. I'm not sure if you have a death tax. We do. We do. Such? Okay. Yeah. Uh, minority of states now have that. The federal government still has a, a death tax or a state tax. Our rate goes from 10% to 16% on basically after the first million dollars of the estate. That's right. And the big debate is over... The, again, the public employee unions don't want to lose the revenue. Mm -hmm. There are economic analyses out um, actually by some economists that we work with quite a bit that show it would be a net positive for the state if families didn't have to worry about passing on their businesses to their heirs. It would attract business people to the state who may be staying away now because, because of that onerous provision. Uh, but in the short run, it will cost the state probably some money. In the long run, it should be a net positive both for jobs and for revenue for the state. Uh, but I think that it's a good idea that the idea of taxing, you know, you pay taxes all your life on a, especially a family business mm -hmm. and a lot more than taxes you're spending, you know, 24-7 in a lot of cases for decades on your business. And then you get hit um, at the very time when the family is most vulnerable with an estate tax. We think that isn't right. It should be phased out. This measure is on the ballot to hopefully do that. Yeah, well said. I mean, three, free market thinkers think of the death tax as as one that's uh, a detractor. It, it repels. It's it's a de-incentive. It moves businesses out of your state. Um, and the the short-term loss is you don't get the uh, the inheritance tax, but the long-term gain is you grow businesses and jobs in your community. And that's and, and that would be right along the kind of thinking that, that exactly. we would think as well. So, what else is happening here? Well, we have uh, a referendum in Washington state, which is a referendum 74. And referendums are basically when the legislature passes a law, in this case, uh, uh, the same sex marriage law in Washington state, then the people have the ability to uh, put something on the ballot called a referendum to repeal that same law. And uh, of course, we spoke about this earlier in the year about the fact that our legislature, spe despite the fact that they didn't have a budget and they had all kinds of other problems, spent mm -hmm. almost the entire session arguing and debating same-sex marriage is one of the highest priorities in, in state government. Well, I think they did spend the entire session. I, I, I right lost count because day. I think in the last two years yeah. we had six sessions, right. <laughs> if you count up all the special sessions. That's so right. Something of that, like I lost count somewhere in there. But they spent the entire regular session <laughs> debating about the same-sex marriage, and right. they totally forgot about the budget. Right. Um, Despite the fact that that's their their primary goal <laughs> as elected officials is to pass a budget. If nothing else, and clearly in our state constitution, they have to pass a budget, which they wanted to avoid at all costs. And so they decided to argue about uh, gay marriage instead the entire time. Well, I think that is, I mean, I think that's the big takeaway from this is the legislature just completely fell down on their job. Mm -hmm. They did, however, pass the same-sex marriage legislation. They eventually did, and, yep. And this, this is now a referendum to repeal that, um, repeal that decision. Correct, yeah. Okay. 
And, and then uh, the, w right after that, we have two resolutions on the ballot. And in Washington State, every time the legislature decides they're going to make a change to the state constitution, um, they're required to go to the vote of the people. And uh, in this case, both resolutions, fairly um, nothing super exciting about them, although Resolution 8221 actually reduces the state debt limit and re increases the amount of time over which the debt limit would be determined. So instead of three years currently, it would, it would spread it over six years, and it would reduce it from the current 9% down to 8%. Uh, largely from a resolution standpoint, um, this is, uh, I know probably the green eye shades folk and people who are more into the counting side of things would appreciate it. And apparently it would, it would improve or at least maintain a good rating for Washington from a budget standpoint, which is, is probably pretty straightforward. So what happens if you extend the time period by which you, I know this gets a little t t technical, technical, but sure. if, 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 I think it was four years they used the last three, three. Or, the last they three years, to, yep. they used the last three years to establish the debt limit. Right. And then now they want to extend it back to six years. So what does that actually do? What does that really do? You know, effectively what it does, it actually smooths out the ups and downs of the uh, economic situation in Washington State when they go back to look at the calculation of the debt limit. For the most part then, what they're doing is they're reducing the amount of debt that, uh, and, and they, their, their ability to increase it or decrease it as each year goes by. So it really smooths that out. From the bond bonding rating agencies, it just makes it a little bit more stable in Washington State. So it should so. give us a better forecast for what, what, what our income is going to be, and then they bring the debt limit down just a touch, right. and basically makes us more more fiscally responsible as a state is what that would do. That's what, that's the intention, and I, I don't think there's been a lot of criticism on this particular resolution. It's been fairly straightforward from that standpoint. The other resolution has to do with the ability of both of our state universities to invest public funds into the private sector. And there's been some controversy on that resolution. It's a change in our state constitution, section uh, 29 of our state constitution, basically allowing these two uh, universities to invest some of their money into the, the private sector. Interestingly enough, the critique of that has been from both sides of the political perspective. On one side, um, they've argued, on the more conservative side, they've argued that there's a cronyism element. Nobody wants uh, the universities to invest in Solyndra for example. Right. On the other side, there's been a left-wing critique of this saying that uh, they don't want the universities exposed to the private sector in that kind of a way. So it's kind of an interesting, this, this resolution is probably a little bit more controversial, but uh, that will be on the ballot, and it's resolution 8223. Is there, are there other um, ballot measures that you'd like to touch on from, from Oregon at this point? Well, or? just to make a comment on, okay. the, on the one about reducing the debt limit. Oregon doesn't have a debt limit for state government. Okay. We do have debt limits for city and county government, which is sort of interesting. Uh, our constitution prohibits cities and counties from going too far into debt, but not the state itself. And uh, our primary responsibility for our legislature also is to pass a budget, and mm -hmm. we have a balanced budget requirement, just like mm -hmm. Washington. But I always say they, they spend every penny, plus they borrow more, which right, they right. do. And so we have a relatively good bond rating also, but there's no guarantee that that won't go away. So the idea of limiting how far the state can go in debt, I think, is a, is a, is a good idea. Mm -hmm. That is a, an issue of lots of debate in <laughs> Washington right now, so <laughs> whether it's a good idea. There's, there are legislators that, that legislators that believe that their sole job is to go raise taxes and raise the debt limit. And That's support, right. So and you know, on, on the idea of the universities investing in stocks and bonds, Oregon has probably a similar prohibition against the, the government, uh, the state government investing in private markets. Uh, with exceptions like for our PERS public retirement system, right. which yours does too. Mm -hmm. uh, the universities were debating now trying to make them either more independent, so they could do this sort of thing in effect, or less independent. We've, we're sort of schizophrenic in Oregon right now. We're trying to make one uh, seamless system between pre-kindergarten through university system. At the same time, the universities are clamoring for more independence. So mm -hmm. how that's going to end up uh, I agree that you know, one of the concerns is the cronyism. Mm -hmm. You know, if um, public entities invest in the market, you know, are they going to invest with their friends? Right. Is it going to be another Solyndra? Although Solyndra stock is probably pretty cheap right now. So <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <It's not> bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, two historic advisory votes are going to be on on the ballot, first time ever in, in Washington. Washington. Yep. Uh, do you want to just highlight those those two? Yeah, pretty much. It, it's uh, they're calling them House Bill twenty five ninety and House Bill sixty six thirty five. So the advisory bo vote is basically based on the actual or the Senate bill. I should say the second one, but basically the advisory vote is is named for the 
a vote that was actually taken at the legislature. So the, when people get a chance to actually vote on this, they know what the primary uh, legislative vote or bill was that they're voting on. And um, one of them was on exempting the, the Senate Bill 6635, was on mortgage interest income, which is exempting banks on their, for mortgages, they don't have to pay b and taxes. And this particular one now said that they do have to pay b and taxes unless they have, uh, they don't operate in more than 10 states. So basically it's just imposing on big banks. Uh, so peop uh, people get to decide uh, whether they think that's a, a great use of, uh, of tax revenue to, to try to get it from, uh, from those folks. The other one is a expansion of a tax that they imposed on wholesale petroleum products. So it's just increasing the tax, that, a fee that they've had for a while. What's really interesting about this, though, is that um, this was the first advisory vote under Iman's 960 initiative. And I know that our attorneys were watching very closely, waiting <laughs> until the last, because they, believe me, they waited until the very last minute to put both of these on the ballot. And we thought we might have to send a nice letter over there to remind them that they were required to do that. Well, it's the kind of thing that the Freedom Foundation really <laughs> watches. It. We're, we're, we, we like that. Uh, we're, we're not. I know we're criticized for being proponents of no government. We're not for no government. We're for an efficient, better government. And when there are rules that are imposed on government, we like to see those enforced. So those That's are the right. kinds of things that we would watch very closely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just very interesting things with these advisory votes and the way that this has come about. But for the viewers out there. Uh, if, if you want to send the message to the legislature that they're doing a good job, uh, vote yes on the, uh, on the advisory votes. If you want to send the message to them that they're, that they're not doing a good job, uh, vote no on the advisory votes, I suppose. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's a, it gives you a chance. I mean, yeah. it, people like to complain about government, and they say that I don't like how my, uh, the, state, the legislature is operating. This gives you a chance to actually say it without pretty much consequences to the voters specifically, but at least that uh, sends a message to your elected officials. And then, of course, you can follow up with an email to each of your, each of your representatives <laughs> out there, too, and let them know That's what right. you think. So. That's right. Steve, what else is happening there in, in Oregon? Well, another interesting measure is, and I'm not sure in Washington, but in Oregon, uh, there's only one county that has a real estate transfer tax. Basically, when you sell your home you, in Washington County, which is a major suburb of, of Portland, in effect, mm -hmm. you pay one-tenth of one percent tax mm -hmm. to the county. Uh, the realtors put on the ballot this time a prohibition against any more real estate transfer taxes at the state level or at any local levels. I'm not sure if there's anything similar. We have that everywhere, so everywhere? Okay. we would appreciate looking at how this works. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the argument from the opponents of this, again, the public employee unions and people who you know, would like to see things like real estate transfer taxes, their argument is that, well, there's no specific proposals anywhere right now to create new real estate transfer taxes, which is technically true. But so why would they oppose it? They obviously oppose it because they'd like to have the option of putting real estate transfer taxes on, and the realtors know that, and so they are waging a fairly expensive campaign to uh, stop any more real estate transfer taxes. Part of the argument against it from quote unquote good government people is that this would lock it in the Constitution, and the Constitution technically shouldn't be for specific things like this. It should be the sort of guiding framework for the state to operate under, not saying which specific taxes should or shouldn't be allowed. Uh, but again, everything else being equal, I think uh, prohibiting uh, taxing uh, people's homes when they sell them is probably a good idea. Yeah, we have a uh, real estate excise tax in the state of Washington, and so every time you sell uh, a, a piece of real estate, there's a chunk that goes to the state uh, to, to be wasted in the ways that the state know, only, <laughs> only state knows how. So. <laughs> well, now, does this actually change the Constitution, do you say? Yes. Oh, really? So it's yeah. actually a constitutional? Constitutional amendment that would prohibit wow. any new real estate transfer taxes that grandfathers in the, the one that's in Washington County. Okay. Um, which, again, most people, unless you actually bought or sold a piece of property in Washington County, and even if you did, you know, it's among all the different charges that are on there, and, you know, uh, you maybe didn't even notice that it. it hasn't been too high, but, you know, obviously it could be raised, and the state could raise whatever it wanted if uh, this prohibition doesn't go through. Well, you guys have a lot cooking in Oregon. We've got a lot cooking in Washington. So where could people go to find more information? Do you, do you have information on your website? or we, we don't have a specific voter's guide this time around, but people can go to cascadepolicy.org. Uh, we have a specific statement from our board of directors there on our marijuana measure. I've written quite a bit on the Measure 85, the corporate kicker for the children measure uh, as such. And um, you know, they can see all of our information there in terms of all the issues that we, that we deal with. Fantastic, and for those watching, if you'd like more information on the Washington State Initiatives, you can go to our website, 
uh, informedvoterguide.com, and you can see all the initiatives and ballot measures for Washington. You can also go on October 25th, the We the People group here in Vancouver holding a forum for an hour about the initiatives. It's at 7 p.m. at the Vancouver Library. And there's a couple of other things post-election. People are going to be scratching their head wondering what's going on. Did the world end? Did it get better? What happened? We're going to help you make sense of that. Of that. Uh, the Freedom Foundation is doing tour stops all over Washington it called our Free Wa Tour. Uh, uh, it's a tour. It's, that's what we're doing. We're going out. We're making sense of the elections. You can go to freewatour.com. And here in Vancouver, November 10th at 6 p.m., at the Old Spaghetti Factory, uh, we'll be there talking about uh, what happened in the elections. And Cascade Policy Institute has the Freedom Seminars coming up. And you can go to freedomseminars.org on November 17th. Tom Palmer from the Atlas, uh, Atlas, Atlas Economic Research Foundation, yeah, National Atlas. Foundation. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna put on a seminar and they're going to talk about free market ideas and where we're going from here. So. With that, I'd like to make a special thanks to Steve Buckstein from Cascade Policy Institute. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, Scott. And uh, my partner, uh, Glenn Morgan, for <laughs> hanging with me and, mm -hmm. and making the trip down to Vancouver. Uh, thank you very much to thecouv.com for having us in your studio and let us, letting us use this facility to get the message out to all the voters in uh, Washington and Oregon. With that, I'd like to thank you very much, and we'll talk to you next time.